Hey everyone, I have a guest that always shows up for us on Monday, but I reached out to him yesterday evening. I said, you know what, I have a question for you that I think you are the best person to answer, and he said, let's do it. So first, let's welcome Greg Dickerson back to the show. How you doing, man? Doing great, Michael. How about you? I'm doing all right. So again, I came up with the question last night. You were gracious enough to say, let's talk about it, uh, you know, back-to-back days, so thank you. Uh, but for the audience, the question is, what makes a great entrepreneur? Uh, because I've always thought of myself as either an employee or an investor. And when we speak, I think you are an entrepreneur, you know, left, right, and center. So what, what, what does it take to be a great entrepreneur is how we'll start this discussion. Well, you know, so let's start with the definition. If you look in the dictionary, you know, the definition is, is an entrepreneur is one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risks of a business or enterprise. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different definitions of entrepreneurship out there. And um, there's even one that talks about, you know, a Hollywood, you know, promoter, you know, or a movie or act, actor promoter. But to me, what entrepreneurship is, is creating something out of nothing, solving problems, creating opportunity, and building, growing and scaling businesses. To me, that's what entrepreneurship is, creating something out of nothing, solving problems, creating opportunities, where uh, problems lie. Okay. And would you say entrepreneurs are made, born? Can it be learned? Because again, your career starts in the military. Uh, then you, you get a job. And then you just start this tremendous track record of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. What do you think? So, you know, a lot of it's vision. But yeah, I think, I think if you look at... Um, the great entrepreneurs of our time, you know, like the Sam Zells or the Jeff Be uh, Bezos or the Bill Gates or, you know, Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. you know, and my career to a small degree, I think we are born mm -hmm. because we're just, we're risk takers, we're visionaries. And, you know, we just, we believe that we have the ability to accomplish what we set out to accomplish. So I think in that sense, a lot of people can be natural born entrepreneurs. And when you go mm -hmm. back into the childhood of a lot of people like that, um, you know, a lot of people did a lot of things, but you know, I was always out knocking on doors, raking, you know, leaves, cutting grass, washing cars, you know, whatever it took to make money. Right. So I learned at a very early age that where there's a problem, somebody's grass is long and it's too hot and they don't want to go out and cut it. There's an opportunity. I'll cut your grass for you. It's hot outside. You really don't want to do it. You know, and, and I'm in this cute little kid, you know, and I'm talking eight, nine, 10 years old. I've got wow. my lawnmower. I got my gas can. Mm -hmm. How are you going to say no? Right. right. So <clears throat> I learned at a very early age to create a compelling offer, an offer they can't refuse, yeah. you know, in, in the time when they needed it the most. So, uh, you know, I think that was born into me. But at the same time, you know, my dad would not give me money. He said, if you want it, you go make money and earn it and you pay for it. So some of that was taught yeah. in terms of, he said, you know, go make some money, figure it out. <laughs> figure it you out. Know, yeah. You know, he didn't, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if he like taught me how to go knock on doors and do that. Cause he never went with me. You right. know, he just said, there's a lawnmower, there's a gas can. If you use it, you know, you're going to pay for it. Right. You know, and he would take a percentage of everything I made to cover the cost of the gas and the maintenance on the lawnmower. Wow. And I had to do the maintenance, clean it and all that. So he taught me how to take care of it. He taught me the cost of doing business. Huh. But he basically said, if you want it, go get it. All right. So I, I, I love that. So you want it, go get it. Because again, I think you're right. I think, you know, I mean, you go back and you, you, you listen to Gary Vanderchuk. I'm, I'm sure you know who Gary V is, right? Yeah. He, t he talks about picking people's flowers in their front yard and then selling it to them at the door, yeah. right? There, there's just a young hustle out there um, that, you know, that, that is that, I think that's that parent's mentality, right? You're not going to get anything for free. Uh, if you want it, go get it. I, I, I love that. And again, I want to go back to a couple of things you said. First off, being a risk taker. Mm -hmm. right? Risk, risk to some people is a dirty word to others. It's maybe even underappreciated, right? There's a spectrum, right? I, and would you say that most entrepreneurs, I guess they acknowledge risk like you just did, but they don't look at it as the first thing, right? It's, it's kind of like third or fourth on the list. While others who maybe aren't natural entrepreneurs, they put risk as number one and they never get by it, right? They never start. Is, is yeah. risk one of those things? 
It is, it is. Risk is something that when you're younger, you don't think a lot about it because you don't have a lot to lose, right? Uh -huh. So you just go for it. And you know, that was me. I was at a point in my life where I just went for it. And I've always been a risk taker mm -hmm. where um, I will calculate it. And of course, success in entrepreneurship, success in investing is the ability to calculate and understand the risk and the worst case scenario and be mm -hmm. okay and be able to weather it and be able to survive it um, and not let it you know, take you down if the worst case does happen. So being able to assess and understand and calculate risk is mm -hmm. huge. And that's where people that fail, they miscalculate the risk and they don't have the ability to with, withstand the downside if and when it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an interesting thing because, you know, I tell a lot of people, hey, when you're young, go for it. Get out there, go for it. You know, you've got, you don't, you can always start over. Right. The interesting thing is there's a lot of cases of entrepreneurs who started late in life. Colonel Sanders is probably the most famous, started sure. Kentucky Fried Chicken in his 60s. Wow. He had nothing to lose at that point in life because he was starting over again. Right. And nowadays when people are living into their 80s and 90s, you know, it's never too late to start over as an entrepreneur and you can always, by understanding and being able to evaluate and calculate risk, you can hedge your downside and protect yourself. Right. So it's a really interesting uh, conversation. Now, that's risk of financial loss, right? right? There's also risk of failure, risk of what are the consequences of failure in people's minds. Mm. So a lot of this goes back to the mindset. A lot of people are afraid to start because they don't want to fail and they're worried about what people will say or think, yes. you know? That's an interesting thing, how that yeah. concept has stopped so much greatness from happen happening in industry, in investing, in anything, in anybody's life. They're so worried about what somebody thinks, they're not even going to start. And, you know, I do coaching and mentorship, and, and that's one of the biggest things I work with with my clients. I have, I have a guy that I'm working with right now, uh, raising some money for some projects. And we got on the phone the other day and said, man, nobody's going to invest in this type of project because it's not a very common thing. It's a different alternative kind of investment. Right. You know, I'm giving them a 10% return. Nobody's going to want to invest in that because they're not going to be able to understand it. And I just listened to him for about five minutes. Tell <laughs> me why it wasn't going to work. And he, right. and he would have given up and not even tried if I hadn't said, listen to yourself. Yeah. You know, you're talking yourself out of this, you know, 10% return. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I said, you just need to show the business model where it's working yeah. and other people that are doing it. That's all. And go prove it to yourself. You know, mm -hmm. so again, limiting beliefs, identify what it is, go find proof that you're wrong, and then get out there and make a plan to make it happen. But yeah, he I, would have just given up right there on the spot had I not, you know, showed him what he was doing. Yes, I tape recorded here. Listen to yourself the last five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's, that would have been a fun conversation to listen to. But I do think risk is that one, one of the variables, and I think there's many I've already picked up on it in this conversation that really designates in my mind, employee, I'll call it employee mindset versus entrepreneur mindset. I don't know if that's a mm -hmm. thing, but that just hit me. Um, risk is that first thing, right? If you sort of see the opportunity, but the first thing you think about is risk to me, based on what you've just said, you're more of an employee mindset, right? Where if you look at the, the value or the thing and you sort of break it down and risk is like fourth or fifth on the list, you know, more of an entrepreneur mindset. Does that, again, I just came up with it. Don't know if it's a thing. Does that feel right so far? Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. You know, the whole employee entrepreneur thing is a different conversation too. Risk is one conversation. Why somebody becomes an employee versus an entrepreneur is another thing. And I did yeah. work in the, in the corporate world, you know, the Navy right out of high school, that was a job. Yep. And then after that, I worked in a corporate environment as well as uh, some other things for a little while before I started my own company but I always had it in me and knew I was going to do my own thing. And I yeah. was a horrible employee. You know, I, I cannot work for anybody, you know, I, I can work for the employee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Terrible. You did not want me working for you. Right. You know, but um, I am a great employee for the people that work for me. Yeah. So think about that concept because my concept of leadership is serving others. The CEO is okay. at the bottom of the pyramid serving up. So when I was, you know, in my organizations, I look at it like I work for the people in my organization. It's my job to give them everything they need, tools, training systems, and support to be successful mm -hmm. and clear direction and know in certain terms exactly what's expected and when, and then hold that performance accountable to the goal. As a CEO, as a leader, that's what your job is. You, you are there to serve your people, which means you work for them, right? Yeah. So I was great in that environment 
horrible as a, as a, in a job. <laughs> know, know thyself, Greg, know thyself. That's what just jumped out at me. That's, that's awesome. The other thing I want to go back to in your opening is belief. Yeah. And again, I could be wrong, but one thing I see in you and I've seen in others as I research this concept is entrepreneurs have almost an unbelievable belief in themselves or what they're doing. Where again, if I go back to being an employee where I kind of set, certainly have, certainly have belief, but it's nowhere close. It's almost superhero like in the entrepreneurs that I see like yourself, the belief that you have to, to, to make it. Is that yeah. fair? Oh, it's huge. You have to believe full on in what you're doing, what your product is. And if you go back again to the iconics, you know, probably the biggest case of belief that we see out there right now is Elon Musk, right? Mm, yeah. I mean, people call him delusional to a degree, <laughs> but man, you know, yeah. that, you know, that guy has some serious belief in what he's doing. And then you look at like a Bill Gates and his product and a Steve Jobs and his product and ideas. And, and then you look at, you know, Jeff Bezos, who didn't really have that much belief. He was just selling books in his garage and had no clue where that was going. But as he's grown, his belief grows. Right. So it can be different levels, right? It okay. doesn't always have to be the world changing idea when you start, but you still have to believe that what you're doing will solve a problem and create mm -hmm. opportunity, create something out of nothing. To me, that's the ultimate definition of entrepreneurship, creating something out of nothing in the belief that what you're doing will solve that problem. Mm -hmm. and you know, that was, you know, it's almost the, um, uh, you, you know, the intelligence of ignorance, right? You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. That can hurt you, but it can also be your greatest asset, you know, because early on in my, my life and my career, I didn't know that I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I thought I could do everything. And that was the belief that I had in my mind. And that's the belief I pour in my mind within my limits, right? I'm not going to go be an NFL quarterback you know, or <laughs> stuff like that. But within the realm of business, yeah. I had no limits. I believed that I had no limits. Now, the only limiting factor was what I knew at the time applied to the vehicle that I had at my disposal, vehicle being business model. Mm. So the difference between the billionaires out there and people like me is just that. It's having the right information at the right time applied to the right vehicle with a mindset of limitless belief knowing that you can do anything. And that, that is where greatness happens and greatness is created. Mm. And that's, that's really the difference. If you study billionaires, you know, and the most successful people in our society, and I'm not saying that the be all end all of this world is to be a billionaire. I'm just talking about the world of business and, and financial sure. success. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at investors, entrepreneurs, you know, titans of industry and you study them, mm -hmm. that's really the difference. They had the right information at the right time applied to the right vehicle with a belief of limitless opportunity and availability. And they just went for it, you know, and they just kept growing and scaling and doing more and more and more. Whereas most people will stop at a point, right. you know, even me, you know, I got to a point where I'm like, you know, that's, that's, that's yeah, enough. You I'm know, good. now I'm going to go into, you know, some other things and do some other things and kind of share what I've learned. And, and I'm on the, on a path of what I'm doing right now, mm -hmm. but I'm not at this point in my life, willing to risk everything I've worked for, uh, you know, yeah. and have to start all over again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's fascinating for me to just kind of sit there. Now I want to go back to, again, our very first conversation back when we did that interview of you, a truck in a toolbox, as I remember yeah. the title. So you, you quit, you quit your day job or you quit your W2 or you're no longer an employee. It's your thing. Right. Do you remember what your vision was for that? I mean, did, could, could you have envisioned where you are today back then? Or was it stages like maybe you were talking about Jeff Bezos, right? Went from selling mm -hmm. lots of books to all these other things. Did your belief grow or did you always see yourself by the time you were, you know, just north of 50 where you're at now? I mean, do you remember? Yeah, so my belief in what was possible grew because, again, I didn't know what I didn't know back then. I didn't know about real estate investing and all that. I, right. All I knew was I'm going to start this handy, handyman remodeling company and grow that into the biggest company in that area. So that's what I did. And then once I hit that, I learned how to build houses and develop real estate. So I wanted to build that into the biggest company doing that. And that's what I did. Right. You know, but again, it was in that area limited to that geography because that's just what I knew. Right. And that's where I was. And I didn't want to be traveling all over the place and doing things because I was raising my kids and yeah. involved in the community. And, you know, for me, with the knowledge and skill sets that I had at the time, I was maxing out there 
And if I'd have had the knowledge that I have now back then, I'd probably be a billionaire right now because, you know, it's a different set of skills and a different knowledge. And it was, you know, formed by the people that I'm around now and that I study now that I didn't have access to back then with bigger ideas and bigger thinking of what I could have done. Right. So it's really interesting. Now, the other thing we never talked about that you don't know is there was a time back at that time when I started that business, I had a job offer with the um, park service down hmm. there um, on the Outer Banks, you know, and they, they handle all the national parks. Now, had I taken that job, the mindset was, you know, it's a good, stable job, benefits and retirement. Okay. I don't know where I'd be right now. And I was offered the job. I had a friend of mine that was working there and he wanted me to come work with him. Right. And I turned it down and, it, you know, and you know, it was a $20,000 wow. a year job. This is 1997, 98. It was a $20,000 a year job. Wow. So I was looking at my options at the time of what to do. Cause this was an area where there, you know, wasn't a whole lot. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any connections. I didn't yeah. know how to start a business, you know, that did anything. And I'd had some little side businesses here and there and I wanted my own company, but it was that moment where I was, I was because of fear yeah. and because of risk versus comfort. So the employee entrepreneur mindset, a lot of it's, a lot of it's fear, a lot of it's risk, and a lot of it's just comfort. Yeah. And, you know, um, and I had two little kids. So I'm wow. sitting here going, should I go take this safe, secure job or should I go keep going with my own business? Yeah. Because I was doing a little bit of stuff. And I said, you know what? I'm not doing that. I'm going to stick with this. and I'm going to do my little business. See, that decision, and, that fork in the road, whatever you call it, um, you know, the path not taken. Well, we all know where you would be if you took that path, right? You'd still be working at the park service or like function. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be where you are today. But that is the ultimate employee mindset, entrepreneur mindset decision, right? Because one is comfort to your point, And one was, you know, at least less comfortable, if not all out ris riskier, right? So mm -hmm. uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I did not know that story. That is awesome. Um, I want to go back and make sure I understand where you are at the truck and the tool back stage. Cause you again, mm -hmm. made it, your mindset was I wanted to be, be the biggest of that. Yeah. What, what, what was it? I mean, what, I mean, how would you, what was the target? Was it an annual revenue? Was it number of employees, number of jobs? I'm just trying to, I'm just, cause again, it's not my natural mindset where, what was the goalpost, right? You were saying you want to be the biggest, but how did you measure it? You think? Yeah. So back then it probably would have been a revenue thing because I was the chairman of the okay. remodeling council down there. So I knew all the other guys in the business that, yeah. that were doing it and they were all looking to me to help them grow like I did. Okay. So it was a revenue thing because most remodelers, you know, I think on average right now might do 800,000 million a year or something like that. It's not yeah, much. Right. Um, and that's you know, top I was doing, line, not bottom line. Right. Yeah. That's top line sales, you know, yeah. average remodeling contractor. And I haven't looked at it lately, but that, back in the day I used no, to study fine. it. And back then it might've been three to 800,000 a year in gross sales okay. with a 30% margin. Okay. Sure. In other words, that's what you take home before taxes yep. uh, after overhead yep. uh, EBITDA. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so to me it was a revenue goal. So I worked towards that. And then from a building standpoint, it was the same thing. The largest builder in the area in the history of that area had, had done about $60 million. Um, which was, was huge. And he was there at a time when, you know, he caught everything right on the upswing and had a really good land position with a developer there. I came on the heels and I made it to 30 million before I decided to sell, okay. you know, and I took it from, you know, uh, 98 to 2004. Uh, so it was a seven year period yeah. when I sold it at its peak because there just wasn't in that market. I couldn't get the, to the next level to the $60 million mark because everybody was contracting from there. Sure. So when I hit 30 million, I was probably number three in the area and only have been, been there seven years competing with people that were there, you know, 15 years before me. Yeah. So it was really interesting, you know, how that works. So it was a revenue standpoint. So it wasn't staff. It wasn't, you know, number of projects. It wasn't number of deals. It was revenue. So you're sitting there. You, I, I just, again, I used to sell, sell tools in high school, right? Sear, craftsman tools. I picture you there with a little Sears Roebuck or a craftsman toolbox, you know, a hammer and some screws, screwdrivers. And you're going, I'm going to do a million bucks a year, right? I'm going to be the biggest, mm -hmm. baddest of this. Um, that is true vision, faith uh, in yourself. The other thing I just picked up on is you were already networking, right? You were networking mm -hmm. to have jobs, right? You were the chairman of the remodeling, I forget, board or something? Yeah, so the, so the Home Builders Association, you know, has a, uh, a, a group within it called the Remodeling Council. Mm. Um, so I was involved in the Home Builders Association and 
chairman of that remodelers council. So I was studying, you know, benchmarks and stuff from the National Association of Home Builders and the Remodeling Council, and I learned a lot. And I had builders down there that, you know, would send me their work as a remodeler because uh, that's all I was doing at the time because they didn't have time to do it. They were building houses. So if anybody called them and said, hey, you know, you built my house 10 years ago, would you do an addition or renovate it? This is not call Greg. He does that. God. So that's where all my work came from. So yeah, I was networking. Um, and see, that's really me. So I'm a going back to me as a little kid. You know, yes. my mom used to say, you know, I'm Greg, Gregarious. My mom <laughs> would say I had the gift of gap. So I would always be out in the neighborhood talking to anybody, adults, nice. you know, whoever. So I, I, you know, I had that ability to talk to anybody anywhere on their level. So I can relate to anybody at any level of society, up or down, doesn't matter race, race, race religion, whatever. I'm just that guy. You know, right. I get to know people Gifted and gap. I love hearing people's stories and learning about people and I'm a seeker of wisdom. Wow. So when I moved to that area, First thing I did was, you know, get involved in the community. And I started getting involved in all these different things. I mean, I coached all my kids' sports. I volunteered and I was on the boards of all the, you know, nonprofits and my church. And just, I'm just wired that way. I'm, right. I'm a guy who gets involved and makes things happen, gets things done. I'm an entrepreneur. You yeah. make things happen, you get things done. Yeah. You know, so a lot of stuff stems from all that over the years. But, you know, the biggest thing, I guess, for me is I've always had this fire in my belly to do more. So whatever it is I do, I want to max it out and I want to make the most of it in the least amount of time with the least amount of energy and effort possible. So if it's making money, I want to, I want to look at a business model. How can I make the most amount of money with the least amount of time, energy and effort possible? Right. If it's an organization, how can we be as efficient as possible? You know, if it's uh, whatever it is, I'm an, I'm an efficiency expert. That's what I look for is how to make it better. Now, that's not always because there are some things where you're there you know, and there's, you know, things that, that work, but you can always find more efficient ways to do things, especially as technology has evolved, you know, throughout the years. But I don't meddle with things just to be meddlesome and I'm not unsatisfiable. I just have this desire and this, you know, awareness that I was created for, for more, that I was created to do great things. Mm. And if I don't utilize the gifts I was given that I was born with, then I'm wasting them. And the last thing I want to do is when I meet my maker, you know, and God, you know, to look at me and say, dude, do you know what you could have been? <sighs> do you know the gifts I gave you that you did not use to wow. the fullest? That's what I don't want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Know? yeah. And be shown what you could have been. You <laughs> could know? have been here, buddy. Yeah. Shame on you. So if you talk about risk, to me, that's the ultimate risk is not using your gifts, your talents, your resources, everything to your fullest ability. To me, that's risk. That's amazing. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna rewatch that. I'm gonna rewatch that a couple of times. That's that's wow, that's pretty powerful. Uh, so let's switch gears a little bit because again, when and sure. when we were communicating yesterday, it was the employee mindset, which is what I think I have, the uh, entrepreneur mindset, which you clearly have. But there is this third leg of the stool, at least as I see it, and that's the investor. Mm -hmm. Right now, do you see the investor mindset different than the first two? Is it a flavor of one or the other? You know, how do you what do you think about an investor mindset? Just yeah, it is different okay. in the sense of a curriculum of a of a profession. OK, okay. Um, and a vocation. Now, nothing wrong with employees. I don't want anybody to watch this and think we're about oh, no, employees or anything, because, you know, entrepreneurship is not right for everybody. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to just leave your job and go do this. <laughs> you know, Amen. you, you got to have skills, training, education, and the ability and desire and, the, the, you know, yeah. all of that. And there's a path for that. And you need workforce. You need employees mm -hmm. for the world to go around. So that's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, an entrepreneur, again, is a, is a, by vocation, is a business owner, okay? It's somebody who's involved daily and, act, and actively involved. When you move to the investor level, which is where I evolved to, sure. you know, entrepreneurial investor, you then own and you make investments in things that you're not involved in from a daily standpoint. Right. So to me, that's the difference. So an employee works in the organization. The entrepreneur creates the organization. Yes. The investor is the one that's over all of it. That's not in anything on any daily basis. You're basically just, mm -hmm. you know, investing your funds and funding the operations and, and making investments. And managing the little tweaks here and there. And, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah. That, and you that, can be totally passive like a market, you know, or something like that, or a real estate syndication where you're an investor that's just totally passive and you have yeah. no active involvement. Then you have activist investors, you mm -hmm. know, at the for sure. know, uh, equity level, stock level. 
where they come in, take positions, get on yep. the board, and then they affect change. Yep. And then you have uh, equity capital active investors like me that in invest either intellectual capital, time, talents, or cash, and then I take over, you know, yep. like a Marcus Lemonis model. Like if I'm going to invest, I'm going to have control. Right. That's me. So I'm activist. If I'm going to invest, I yeah. want control. <laughs> I I see that in you. <laughs> I get that one. That's, that's very cool. So th this is this is so much fun for me. And again, back to the employee thing. Again, folks, I uh, I've said this lots of times on my channel. I I was a good employee, right? That that was yeah. my mindset. Uh, again, I've talked about a mantra. My mom, my mother watches these videos. I don't know if you've heard me say that. She'll watch this video. She, she's going to hear this, and I know I'm going to get a text later today. She had a mindset. Yeah. She had this mindset when I was going to grade school. It said, "Now, Michael." Go to school, get a good, get good grades, get a good education, so you get a good job, make a lot of money. She said that yeah. to me every day for the, the better part of 10 years. I mean, I, it's like tattooed on my brain. Mm -hmm. So again, I consider myself a good employee, right? I, I got a new organization. I used my tools and traits. I understood the job. I always tried to do 150% of the job. And that's, what, that's where I made my name, became very good at what I've done, taking products from zero to hundred million multiple times, right? As a sales leader. Um, but my idea was I was spinning off that capital so that I could build my investment portfolio, right? And I got there late, right? So you're, you're an entrepreneur, I'm an employee. We did what we did really well. And then I, then I moved to an, in, the investor and uh, have done a couple of things in that, that realm. So I'm comfortable calling myself an investor now because again, like you say, right, you build the systems, you build the teams, you, you make mm -hmm. the key decisions, right? Finding the deal, sourcing capital, and then you just manage the, pe the people in the middle, which I don't want to do. I don't lift hammers. I don't paint. I don't do any of that stuff. But I can change people in, out, all of that. And I suffer the wins and the losses, right? If the deal wins, great. The deal loses, great. Um, so so I, you're an entrepreneur as well. So let's go back to that. How this is where I need mom. help. This, this is why yeah. I need help because... I have never felt comfortable calling myself that. So this is what I wanted yeah. to get to. Yeah, so you are, and we'll get through that. So first for your mom and your dad, is your dad still alive? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for your parents, they were brilliant. They did absolutely what they should have done and what they were supposed to do. Okay, I was told you're either going to be dead or in jail before you're 30, <laughs> and when you go into the military. That's all I ever heard. You know what I mean? Because I was a train wreck, so... Uh, yeah, that's all. That's I not good, on. folks. Don't tell your kids that. That's bad. <laughs> so I was not wired for school. So... <laughs> In your parents' era, in my parents' era, my dad was career military. My mom was career Blue Cross Blue Shield, 30 years. No entrepreneurs in my family at all. No. Wow. All career people. Civil okay. service, military, everybody. All the men were military. You know, uh, my mom was the only career woman in my family line. The other ones were housewives. Never okay. worked. My grandmother, my mom's dad, uh, his, his wife, she never even had a driver's license. I mean, it's just, oh, wow. you know. So anyways our parents and their parents, that's the world, right? You, you go to school, you get a good education and you get a good job. That's what the institutions are there for, to yep. train you for a job, for a mm -hmm. vocation. That's what makes the world go round. So they absolutely did the right thing by you because you went to college and not only that, you got your graduate degree. Mm -hmm. So cool. very few people do that. So that was, that was beautiful. And the fact that they did that for you the difference is we're in a different world now and you were trained to be an employee. Mm -hmm. That's so that's who I hired. I hired MBAs and PhDs to work for me. Right. That's who, that's who I learned from people like you. I would hire you and I would learn from you. You would be my mentor. Wow. So that's how I learned. That's how I got my education through the people that I hired and by studying other people who had higher education because I didn't have it and I wasn't wired that way. And I, I didn't have that opportunity. So, um, you know, but I am a lifelong learner. Yeah. So that's one of the ways I learned. So that was absolutely perfect. That's the way the world used to work. It's very different now because you used to be able to count on, you know, going to school, going to college, getting that job. And then that company would take care of you the rest of your life after you put 20, 30, 40 years in there. It doesn't work that way anymore. Very different world now. As we've seen, uh, anything can and will happen. And there is no loyalty in the corporate world. And even the big companies can go bankrupt. GM, Enron, you know, some of the yeah. Amazon. Amazon can go bankrupt, folks. So can Facebook. So can YouTube. These companies yeah. can go away. So there is no loyalty at the corporate level because they can't guarantee their existence, much less yours. Right. Uh, so the only guarantee you have in life is your own abilities, your own skill set, and your own knowledge. Right. Um, which is the most valuable thing there is. Like people will say time is your most valuable resource. Uh -uh. Mm. You know, 
time is time can't earn you money. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can't go exponentially uh, increase income off your time. You only have so much time, mm -hmm. but your knowledge you, that's infinite. You can grow your wealth. You can leverage your knowledge and create as much wealth with the amount of time you have every day. Mm -hmm. So time is not exchangeable for dollars at scale. Right. Knowledge and wisdom is skill right. sets. So for you, you went the traditional path and now you are an entrepreneur because you did create something out of nothing. Look what's behind you right there. One rental at a time. Yeah. You took a risk. That's an entrepreneurial risk that you could have been rejected. Sure. That you could have bombed that people would have said, this book's stupid. Threw it, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't even find it in the basket by the toilet. It's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, but yeah. You, you took a risk. You took a risk to do that. You spent money developing yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. You took a risk on the hub. Okay. You've created opportunity. And now here's the other thing about entrepreneurship, not just for yourself. So entrepreneurs create opportunities for others. Right. Okay. Uh, we look to solve problems and benefit others and create opportunities for others and for communities and for cities and states and governments and, you know, institutions around the world. That's what entrepreneurs sure. do. It's not about ourselves. We're creating opportunity for everybody. The hub is a hub of entrepreneurship. You're creating opportunity for the individuals there. No question. The community around it and for the global economy as a whole, because what is the economy? It's mm -hmm. when one person buys something from another yeah. and then they earn the money and then they buy from another and another and another. That's what makes the world go around on a global macroeconomic scale. Now wow. that wasn't there when you were a kid. Mm -mm. It didn't work that way. Yeah. I mean, the economy did, but right. the global macro connectivity of the economy wasn't like that. So you are absolutely the epitome of an entrepreneur. I have to get comfortable with that because everything you've just said is absolutely right. Um, I'm so happy we're having this conversation because, again, I've been stuck on that. Because when I look at guys like yourself, whether you know at your level, below, above your level, I'm like, I'm not him. I, I, I'm, I don't do that. But you're right. I think that last thing was really eye-opening for me. I always thought entrepreneurship, or at least as I was internalizing the definition, it's about me, right? I've got to be, for example, I got to be at the hub. I got to be talking about deals. I got to be doing that. But no, if you create an environment where you put like-minded people together that, that is net positive for them, which it clearly is, that they're doing deals together. Every once in a while, one spits out for me. Awesome. So yeah. That's what I enjoy. The hub is to real estate in Fresno what this is to everybody in the world. Uh, Steve Jobs didn't create this for himself to use right. to benefit himself. He created <laughs> this for everybody in the world to use to benefit the world. Oh, I feel so much better now. So you're a real estate entrepreneur mostly. Yes. You yeah, know, for sure. That's where your, your, your investments are, but it goes deeper than that. You know? Yeah. And that's when yesterday, when you sent that text, I was like, think on that a little bit deeper. You might find that you are an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I've read yeah. that a couple of times. That's amazing. See, look at that. I, am, I, I feel like a weight has been lifted off my back. Yeah, you're the epitome of an entrepreneur. And it's at different levels, right? So then there's yeah. social entrepreneurs. What do they do? Social entrepreneurs don't go out and solve a social problem for themselves. Yeah. It's for the world. Right. Huh. I feel better. Oh, today's going to be a good day. Uh, <laughs> so the last thing you said, and, and you put it in your uh, comment, I was going to try to pull it up, about an investor. I don't remember. I've read it so many times. You think I'd remember. Where is it? One sec. I'm sorry. Where is it, Greg? Add, add that when investing, think about investing or evaluating investments. One should think and view the standpoint of an entrepreneur or a business owner, not an investor. Right. And then you say that changes the game. And I got to admit, I've read that 50 times and I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm missing. I think I'm missing a piece. So, so help, when help people invest, yeah. when people invest in something, they generally think about the return on their investment and the risk of losing their capital. Okay. okay. What should you be thinking about? Yeah. You should be thinking about, well, this is a business. I'm investing in a business. What are the fundamentals of that business? Ah, uh, Okay. Right. So think about your investments. So if you're out there and you're investing in things, think about your investments from the standpoint of a business. Okay. Okay. Your cash is finite that you have to invest. Your time sure. is finite that you have to spend, uh, 
you know, on those investments. So when you think about it from a business model standpoint, you're trying to get the highest return on that capital, you know, time, energy, and effort possible. So you start thinking of like a business owner from the standpoint of the fundamentals of the businesses and the things that you're investing in. So looking at it that way versus, am I going to get a 5% return here or 10%, you know, return oh. there? Yeah. You know, is this, what's this real estate syndication deal? What's it going to do? So think like an entrepreneur, think like a business owner when you're nice. making investments and approach it from that standpoint. Thank you. Now I get it. All right. This, this has been very helpful, uh, Greg. This, 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 this was a problem for me. I was, I was stuck. I don't know if you sensed that yesterday in our communication, but I was definitely stuck. You've been very helpful to me today. I wanted you to know that. And I appreciate you giving me some time today. Uh, any closing yeah. comments on entrepreneur, employee, investor as we wrap this up? Yeah. So everything is right for everybody. So number one, know thyself. Know what your skill sets are, what your sweet spot is, what you're meant to do, you know, and figure that out and go with that. And if entrepreneurship is your thing, understand what it is like we talked And it is not for everybody because the entrepreneurial journey can have its ups and its downs. Yeah. And when you, when you take risk, as long as you're able to, the key to entrepreneurship and success and business investing and everything is to be able, be, being able to accurately um, analyze, calculate risk and be able to withstand the worst case scenario, the mm -hmm. worst case outcome. And, you know, that's at the end of the day, my Siri keeps popping up. For some yeah. At the end of the day, um, you have to be comfortable with that. What's the worst case scenario? And am I, am I okay if that happens? Yeah. Well, Greg, some people need to start following me on YouTube and how can they follow you? Again, you've helped me immensely today. I know you can help others. How, how should people reach out or follow you or get part of your uh, coaching programs? Yeah, gregdickerson.com. I'm on YouTube. You just Google Greg Dickerson, uh, real estate entrepreneurship. You'll see me pop up, but gregdickerson.com, everything is there. And I'm on all the social media sharing, you know, everything I have to offer to the world before I check out. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And again, you're doing videos every day, right? Yeah, every day. Every day, your machine. Just something hits me, you know, so either somebody will ask a question or something will hit me or I'll read something or see something and I'll just boom. So yeah, every day uh, I've got something going out and they're short, they're straight, they're to the point, you know, and, and people seem to like it. Very cool. Well, you need to go to gregdickerson.com, check him out. He's helped me immensely today. Hopefully you guys have felt that. I truly felt a weight off my back. So Greg, thank you very much for the day. Uh, take care, buddy. Yeah, you too.